Water is important, obviously. Currently, California is emerging from a drought. So, in theory, we all have a heightened awareness about water use. Realistically, though, many people, unfortunately, still use water recklessly and have very little knowledge about how much water they are using. We'll try to get a handle on our own personal water use later in the lesson, but first let's look at why water is important. Indeed, water is essential for all living organisms. Also, water shapes our landscape through geological processes of weathering, erosion, and, and deposition. Additionally, it helps moderate our climate, both globally as a greenhouse gas and regionally in coastal, coastal locations. Consider where Kenyatta College is located in a coastal region of California. Compared to similar latitude locations in the middle of the United States, like Kansas, we have much milder winters and much milder summers as well. We have noted that water is essential for all living organisms. So what exactly do we humans use water for? Some of these uses are obvious, though some are less so. Most people would have no problem listing the first four uses, though many would be shocked at the amount of water that we use to grow our food. Check out infographic 14.3. Agriculture uses about 70% of our water nationally, and that number is likely higher in California. Also consider the statistics reported in infographic 14.6. It takes 1,850 gallons to produce a pound of beef. That's 462.5 gallons per quarter pound burger, and you haven't even added the bun, tomato, lettuce, cheese, or fries. Think about how much water it takes to feed you for a day, a week, or a year. The last four uses on this list are a complete mystery to most folks. Water is needed for nearly every manufactured product. Your textbook notes that it takes 2,900 gallons of gas to create a pair of blue jeans. Imagine what it might take to create your whole wardrobe or a car. Also, approximately half of all freshwater extractions in the United States are for thermoelectric power generation making electricity at coal, natural gas, and nuclear power plants. Notably, though, most of this water is used for cooling towers and is returned to the environment fairly quickly. Other energy sources take water, too. It takes one to two and a half gallons of water to produce a gallon of gasoline, and three and a half to six gallons of water to produce a gallon of ethanol. Thus, you can significantly reduce your water use by consuming less manufactured products and by consuming less energy. That is important. Notably, as we ponder the amount of water humans need, we must also remember the number of humans on Earth is increasing. Additionally, as developing nations develop, the average per capita water use is also increasing. Towards the end of this lesson, we will revisit water use in general and also try to better quantify our own personal use. But first let's make sure we have a good understanding of water in general and how it moves through the Earth's system. Water is a fascinating substance. On one hand, water is all around us. About 75% of the Earth's surface is water. There is water in the air around us and in the soil. Further, the average adult human body is nearly 60% water. Water is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. But yet, Water is very interesting and unique as well. For example, water is the only naturally occurring substance that exists in all three phases, solid, liquid, and gas, on the Earth's surface. Interesting, eh? Also, water expands when it freezes, which is strange because most substances contract when they go from liquid phase to a solid phase. This has many interesting implications. For example, when liquid water seeps into cracks in rocks or roads or sidewalks and then freezes, it expands and breaks apart the rock. This process is called frost wedging, and it is the most common way that rocks break apart. Also, since it expands when it freezes, 
That means the same mass now takes up more space. Thus solid water is less dense and ice floats on top of liquid water. Clearly you've all witnessed that when you drink a glass of ice water. But ecologically this means that lakes and ponds freeze from the top down rather than from the bottom up. Thus organisms like fish, amphibians, insects, mollusks, bacteria, etc. are all able to overwinter beneath the ice. Our world would be a very different place if this was not the case. Next consider that water is a polar molecule. That means that even though it has a neutral charge over all, the charge is separated, giving one part of the molecule, the hydrogen atoms, a positive charge, and the other part of the molecule, the oxygen atoms, a negative charge. Thus, since opposite charges attract, water molecules form bonds, called hydrogen bonds, between one another. These bonds cause the water molecules to stick together. That's called cohesion. These cohesive forces allow you to fill up a glass so that the water actually rises above the rim. It also allows water droplets to form and gives water a high surface tension. Think of some of the water, think of water bugs striding on top of the water, even though the insects are more dense than the water. Next, water has a high heat of vaporization. This means it takes a lot of energy to convert water from a liquid to a gas. Notably, this is because a lot of energy is needed to break the hydrogen bonds mentioned above. Since energy is consumed to convert some of the liquid to gas, the remaining liquid water is cooled. Indeed, evaporation is a cooling process, and your body uses this evaporative cooling to cool you when you sweat. That is why you need to drink a lot of water when it's hot, so that your body can use that water to cool you through evaporation. Notably, all the energy that it takes to evaporate water is stored as latent heat, and when water recondenses, heat is released. Refrigerators and air conditioners take advantage of this and work in that same manner. Water is sometimes called the universal solvent because it is able to dissolve so many substances. Again, this property is related to the polar nature of water. Consider an ionic substance like salt, NaCl. The positive parts of the water molecule surround the negative parts of the salt, the Cl minus, and the negative parts of the water molecule surround the positive parts of the salt, the sodium that's positive. In this manner, the salt and many other substances dissolve. In fact, you will never find pure water, only H2O, in the environment. Even raining, rain falling from the sky is dissolving substances into it as it falls. Similarly, our drinking water has many minerals and other substances, including pollutants, dissolved in it as well. Lastly, water has a high specific heat. Specific heat is defined as the amount of energy required to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. That means that it takes a lot of energy to get water to change temperature. This is why coastal communities have a more moderate climate. In the summer, the ocean absorbs a lot of energy that would otherwise heat up the region. And in the winter, when the temperature of the ocean water drops slightly, all that stored energy that was absorbed is released and the region has milder winters. Notably, substances with high specific heat, like water, can be used to make homes more energy efficient. Water tanks are referred to as thermal mass in a home. They absorb the heat during the hot times of the day and release it at night. Some people use thick stone floors for that same purpose. Thus keeping a home cooler in the daytime and warmer at night with no AC or conventional heating. We'll revisit this concept later in our unit on energy. Okay, we've established that water is ubiquitous, but still a pretty amazing substance. Now let's review how it moves through the Earth's system. We covered the hydrologic cycle early in the semester, but we'll take a few moments to review it here. Infographic 14.2 does a good job of showing and labeling most of the major processes in the cycle. But back when you devised your pool and process models, you had to kind of figure out the pools by yourself. Additionally, this diagram shows that the sun is the energy source that drives the cycle. The sun causes evaporation, allowing liquid water to leave the oceans and exist as water vapor in the atmosphere. 
Gravity also plays a role in this cycle, as precipitation, runoff, infiltration, and groundwater flow are all powered by gravity. Another point to remember about the water cycle, and all biogeochemical cycles, is that the Earth is a closed system for matter. Thus matter, water, carbon, nitrogen, etc., does not enter or leave the Earth's system. So the amount of water we have on Earth today has remained virtually unchanged over geologic time, and we can expect the same amount of water into the future. The total amount of water on Earth doesn't change, but water does change from one form into another. Additionally, some pools have long residence times, and some pools have short residence times. For example, water in the groundwater or ocean pool may stay there for millions of years, whereas water in the atmosphere may only exist for weeks, days, hours, or even minutes or seconds before it condenses into clouds. Earlier this semester, we noted that pool and process models are a particularly useful type of model to use as we study biogeochemical cycles. Pool and process models clearly show the pools, where the water hangs out, and the processes that move the water from one pool to another. Additionally, pool and process models allow us to make predictions about what would happen if a particular pool or process was impacted in some way. Here's the pool and process model of the water cycle that we developed earlier this semester. Note that we included six pools and eight processes. You should be able to draw this model. Why don't you pause the video for a moment and review this important model. And also consider which important pool in the hydrologic cycle did we not include? I encourage you to practice drawing the model as well. Start with the ocean pool and figure out what might happen there, evaporation to the atmospheric moisture, condensation to clouds, etc. Were you able to figure out which pool is not present in this cycle? That would be the glacial ice pool, which ironically is the second largest pool in the hydrologic cycle. I allowed us to not include it in our cycle because it's, it's not a pool here locally, although with climate change it is becoming increasingly important for us. Since we're studying environmental science, we want to know how humans fit into this picture. Specifically, I'd like you to consider the human impacts on the hydrologic cycle. How would, how would any of these things influence the natural hydrologic cycle? Urbanization, deforestation, dams and reservoirs, climate change, etc. Take some time right now to study the cycle and determine the specific impacts on specific pools and specific processes that each of these human activities might have. For instance, for urbanization, consider pavement. Which pools are processes are going to be affected by pavement, which are going to decrease, which are going to increase. Pause the video. Check it out. As we're thinking about humans and water, it's worth noting that according to United Nations estimates, half of the world lacks sufficient access to clean water. We take water for granted. Sometimes it's the physical access, it's, it's just simply not there, water is simply not present in abundant amounts. But sometimes it's that the people simply don't have enough money to pay for the water that they need. Also, as populations continue to increase, this is only going to get worse. The United Nations estimates that two thirds of the world will face water shortages by 2025. Wow. 